Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the COVID-19 and International Law Panel. This event is co-hosted by the Western International Law Association and the Public and Private International Law Research Group. And we're thrilled you are all here today. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jessica Redmond, and I am VP Communications for the International Law Association. I have the privilege of introducing our four panelists today. Before I get to the introductions, just a few housekeeping matters. The discussion today is being recorded, but Zoom, as I'm sure you can all tell, is set to webinar mode, so only the panelists can be seen and heard. The event will consist of each panelist speaking on their topic of choice, followed by a moderated question and answer period from a selections of questions both submitted prior to the event and questions submitted by you, our audience, throughout the event. We invite you to submit your questions through the question and answer feature on Zoom. We have four esteemed panelists joining us today who each bring a diverse perspective and background to the discussion. The way our discussion will work today is I will introduce a panelist followed by their remarks and then I will introduce the second panelist followed by their remarks and so on. Our first panelist today is Ubaka Ubogu. Professor Ubogu is an associate professor in the faculties of law and pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences and he is the Cates Research Fellow in Health Law and Science Policy at the University of Alberta. He is a recipient of the Confederation of Alberta Faculty Association's Distinguished Academic Early Career Award and a 2020 Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Fellow. Today he will be speaking on the failure of international health regulations. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ubogu. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and privilege to, to join this uh, very distinguished panel. Uh, I'll keep my remarks very brief um, because I'm more interested in hearing what my panelists have to say than uh, perhaps in, in what I have to say. Uh, but my focus, uh, the focus I was, what I was asked to focus on is on the international health regulations and uh, how it might have failed. It, it seems a bit odd to be talking about international health regulations and how it might have failed now in, in November. Uh, this talk was originally supposed to happen much earlier where the comments I'm going to make will make much sense. Uh, and I've since that time come to see what I'm going to be talking about, not as necessarily a failure of the international health regulations. There, there are some gaps I think that need to be addressed, but more as uh, a failure of persons who have actually signed onto this document uh, and who are bound by it to comply with the spirit of the regulations. So I'll be focusing mainly on the spirit of the regulations, what they are intended to do, and how I think uh, the nations who are signatories to it, including Canada, have, in the way they've responded to this pandemic, uh, departed from that spirit, and how that doesn't serve us well in terms of how we might think about a future pandemic and the responses that nations will have. And some of my remarks, will be salient uh, for what is probably the next big discussion we're going to be having about this pandemic, which is how do we ensure the fair and equitable global distribution of vaccines when we have them. So for those of you uh, who may not be aware of what it is, the International Health Regulations uh, is a set of regulations uh, that has a history dating back to the 1960s. Uh, it started out as the uh, International Sanitary Regulations uh, and uh, it then evolved into the International Health Regulations and uh, it was amended in 2005. There was a major update in 2005 uh, and the regulations uh, con consist of rules that is supposed to guide the global community in dealing with uh, the spread of disease. So it is considered to be the key global instrument for protection against 
the international spread of disease. The focus of the regulations is on early identification of disease that has a potential to spread beyond uh, the, the ground zero, if you will, and uh, to then manage the disease. Uh, so identify it, inform the international community through the WHO, uh, manage it, uh, and also set out, sets out rules for how international travel is supposed to occur when a disease that has a pandemic that is concerning international health emergency is present. So the reason why I'm talking about this is at the start of this pandemic, I don't know, you know if anyone still remembers <laughs> the start of this pandemic, but um, if you do, you'll recall that on the 30th of January, 2020, the Director General of the World Health Organization um, declared that the, the novel coronavirus outbreak uh, was a public health emergency of international concern. This, is, this declaration is actually something that arises out of the Director General's responsibilities and powers on that international health regulation. So that's the point where international health regulations is seen uh, to formally kick into uh, effect, even though uh, as early as the time it's identified, uh, the international health regulations operate. Uh, and that's the set of regulations under which the World Health Organization uh, acts and provides support and under which member states, including Canada, are supposed to provide support to extinguish the disease and avoid its international spread. So, so go back to January and what really happened in January? I remember going on a, a, a TV interview at the time uh, to speak about the repatriation of Canadians uh, from China. Uh, that seemed to be at the time the biggest issue. Why was Canada more interested in terms of its uh, response to what was now an, inter uh, uh, an international, uh, a public health emergency of international concern. Why was Canada more concerned about bringing back its citizens from China? At the time, I felt that that was the wrong move for the government of Canada, that they should be more uh, concerned with helping China to identify uh, where the, the source of the outbreak and making sure that the outbreak was contained in China. But considerable uh, energy was spent on trying to repatriate Canadians. In fact, it became a controversy on its own. Uh, and that controversy centered around the fact that many people felt that uh, the Canadian government was not doing enough to bring Canadians back from China. And here we are today, the disease is with us. Uh, at the time when I, was, I did this TV interview, I argued that if Canada did not change its focus, the disease will surely make it out of China. Uh, and that insisting it was going to bring back its citizens as the primary concern uh, was a wrong focus. And that if this makes it back here, uh, then all that effort would have been wasted because it's here among us. And again, here we are today. Now, I, I, as I said, I'm, I want to allow time for my, uh, my co-panelists to contribute. So I'm just going to say two things about how I think this is a failure of member states to comply with the international health regulations. And then very quickly, what I see as the gaps that should be patched. Because Canada wasn't the only country that did this. In fact, it became a game among uh, developed countries to see which one of them could uh, repatriate their, their uh, citizens. Uh, and you know, there was debate in many jurisdictions in the US, in Europe, certainly uh, or Australia, about whether or not they should repatriate their citizens and how fast they could do that. So two, two very quick things I see as problems here. The first is that the international health regulations, uh, one of the key commitments that member states have to sign up for when they, when they become signatories to this is that they have to agree to collaborate actively in stopping the international spread of disease. And I think the, the early actions of all these countries, and I'm happy to elaborate on this in the question period, did not uh, reflect this very fundamental guiding principle of the international health regulations, which is 
that collaboration is absolutely essential. The second is that they also have to provide support. Um, and the support uh, is supposed to not just be for the in, their own interests, but for the interest of stopping. So the support is geared towards stopping the international spread of disease. And I, I also feel that they didn't do this well enough. Now, in terms of the gaps in the international health regulations, uh, I think it's focus on how you sort of stop the disease, in, identify and stop the disease. Uh, and also um, it's focused on travel, um, leaves out a lot of things that we now know could be properly addressed through international cooperation. Uh, and just to give a, a quick example, I, I think, you know, what we're seeing happening now in the context of vaccines where countries, you know, rich nations have bought up all the stocks of vaccines uh, and have supported development of vaccines geared towards uh, alleviating the, the impact of the disease on their own populations speaks to me as to the need to expand the international health regulations to sort of uh, uh, include things that may happen if the disease were somehow to make it out of uh, one location onto other locations. Uh, and more importantly, to ensure that these values of cooperation and support uh, are really grounded in how we respond to a disease of pandemic proportions. Uh, as we've seen with this example of COVID-19, uh, it doesn't help to be selfish. It doesn't help to think uh, in insular terms. And I think that international health regulations ought to be able to sort of uh, drive the commitment to collaboration, support, and cooperation. And if it doesn't, then we come back to the age-old question about international law, and I'm not an expert in international law, so I'll leave this for uh, those who are to, to respond to that, which is, you know, why do we have it if people abandon it when we need it? Thank you. Thank you for that really interesting discussion on international health regulations and the gaps in response. Our next panelist is Fabian Jelina, who is a professor at McGill University. He heads the Private Justice and the Rules of Law Research Group, is a co-founder of the Montreal Cyber Justice Laboratory, and acts as an arbitrator and consultant on dispute resolution and legal reform. Professor Jelina previously held the role of General Counsel of the International Court of Arbitration of the International Chamber of Commerce. And today we are delighted that he will be speaking to us on investment contracts and COVID-19. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jelina. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you uh, to uh, the organizers for the, the kind invitation. It's a pleasure for me to, to be here uh, with you all. Um, so I'm, I'm here essentially as a result of my, my getting a, a small grant to work with one of, of my doctoral uh, students on COVID and uh, investment law. Um, there, uh, there are a few papers coming out of, uh, of this project uh, and uh, I'm going to say a few words about only one of them. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the work of uh, my doctoral student uh, his name is Lucas Clover Alcalia. Uh, he will uh, defend uh, his thesis. He's already submitted uh, at McGill in, uh, in early December. Um, so in, uh, in the one paper I'm going to talk about, uh, we explore the uh, specific difficulties that arise out of investment contracts uh, in the face of COVID-19, as opposed to investment law more generally. Um, so COVID-19 brings uh, what we may uh, call changed uh, circumstances, uh, a very uh, broad uh, concept. Uh, the, the problems that arise uh, for uh, investment contracts in particular uh, is an un uncommon level of uncertainty uh, about the governing rules. How uh, should we deal with that? It's an important problem because um, very few people realize that the among the ICSID cases, uh, the cases resolved under uh, the Washington Convention, 10% uh, of those cases involve an investment uh, contract. So we're talking about the rules that would uh, govern uh, changed circumstances. Uh, this is a, a very general uh, sort of term to encompass, uh, to take a, a broad view 
of, uh, of the issue. Uh, and this uh, actually links up to different doctrines uh, in different legal traditions uh, and different uh, legal systems. Uh, so we take a transsystemic, international, transnational uh, view of the problem. Uh, you will know some of these doctrines uh, at common law as uh, impossibility, uh, frustration of purpose. Uh, in other uh, legal traditions, you'll uh, know about imprévision, uh, you'll know about force majeure, you'll know about rebus uh, sextantibus, an expression which is known in public international law. Uh, in the German tradition, you have Wegfall or Störung der Geschäftsgrundlage, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, there's a broad variety of possible doctrines uh, that may apply to uh, the changed circumstances brought about by the pandemic. Uh, so the, the central issue for investment contracts is that even where a domestic law is designated as the governing law of those contracts, uh, many international arbitrators will still find a role, a fairly significant role, uh, to be played by international law. That will be a complementary role or uh, even a corrective uh, role to be played by international law. Uh, what's even more uh, problematic is that international law here uh, is not uh, entirely clear. Uh, for those who know a little bit about the uh, history of investment law, uh, most people will recall the, uh, the arbitral award uh, in the Texaco arbitration uh, in the 1970s, uh, rendered by René Jean Dupuis. And uh, there he uh, spoke of an international law of contract, uh, but there's obviously an ambiguity here uh, because in civilian jurisdictions, you have a law of contract for private relations and you have a separate law of contract for administrative contracts, that is contract between private parties and uh, the state. Uh, and this is a different system and so one uh, doesn't really know what uh, the proper source of an international uh, law contract would be uh, between public international law on the one hand and uh, the instruments that we find um, uh, for the governance of private transnational contracts like the Unidroit principles or the, uh, the CISG. And so uh, the role that uh, arbitrators want international law to play uh, in that context uh, create a lot uh, of uncertainty. It opens up a large number of possibilities about the relationship between the governing law designated by the party, by the parties or by the contract uh, and uh, the various versions or sources of international law uh, you may look to. And uh, this is, this is a, a problem even where the parties have designated a governing law. In some contracts, you don't have a governing law designation uh, at all. So I don't have much time. I'll just say that one of the, take, the, the takeaways uh, here uh, is that uh, well-drafted in investment uh, agreements uh, should uh, make extensive provisions uh, for extent for for change circumstances, uh, so as to ameliorate uh, the uncertainty that uh, arise out of the governing law uh, problem. So this is this is of course uh, advice for the future. It's a little bit late uh, when uh, the problem has already uh, arisen, and uh, we already see uh, problems uh, arising out of the pandemic for investment contracts. We've uh, identified uh, at least two. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, in Peru, uh, where uh, the collection of tolls on the highway were suspended uh, to prevent contact between the, uh, the tellers, uh, the, the, the gatekeepers as it were, and the, and the drivers as a result of the pandemic. 
and uh, these uh, are concessions or based on concession agreements and there's a notification of a, an investment arbitration based on that. Uh, there's, all, there's also a case uh, that came up in, in Mexico where the energy uh, regulator uh, got involved in supply management for uh, the provision of power um, and uh, essentially uh, suspended the, uh, the, the pre-operative tests uh, for all renewable energy uh, plants, just getting involved in supply management because the pandemic, and this is a, a, an openly stated reason, the pandemic has drastically reduced uh, demand. So uh, these, these problems are coming up and the only thing I can, I, I, I can do uh, here uh, is offer advice uh, for the future or for the contracts that are being drafted, uh, that are being drafted now. <clears throat> So uh, we took a, a sample of uh, publicly available investment agreements, uh, and we found that um, they do contain in general, uh, relatively detailed clauses uh, that pertain to change circumstances. They do so in terms of force majeure and uh, hardship. And those are the, the terms that uh, are found uh, in transnational law instruments such as the Unidroit principles of international commercial contracts. Uh, these uh, clauses, force majeure and hardship, have uh, an international ancestry in the uh, very old model clauses that uh, the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, has always published uh, for use in international contracts, and uh, which were last amended in March, uh, when uh, in March of this year at the outset of the worldwide uh, outbreak. So this is a, a second finding. You do find uh, these clauses in terms of hardship and fox measure uh, in these uh, investment contracts. But then we looked uh, at how uh, these clauses have been interpreted in some cases by national courts. And uh, I would say a, a third uh, takeaway would be that uh, there's a limit uh, to what can be achieved with uh, such uh, contract clauses, uh, no matter how detailed uh, when a governing law is superimposed on it. So uh, depending on the governing law that uh, will be applied to them, they will be very different things. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much, for your insightful comments, Professor Jelina. Our next panelist is Valerie Osterveld. Professor Osterveld is a full professor at Western Law. She teaches, researches, and publishes in the field of public international law, and she is the co-director of the Public and Private International Law Research Group. Today, she will be speaking on the impact of COVID-19 on international refugee law. Please join me in welcoming Professor Osterveld. Thank you very much, Jessica. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank the International Law Association for all of its work in helping the public and private international law group organize this. So I'm going to talk to you today about international refugee law and COVID-19. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees estimates, there are 26 million refugees in the world today. Under international law, a refugee is defined as a person fleeing their country to another country due to a well-founded fear of persecution on particular grounds. Now, war and ethnic, tribal, and religious strife have displaced people across borders, and 68% of those 26 million refugees are from only five countries, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. At the height of the worldwide lockdown between March and July, 168 countries, this is out of almost 200 countries in the world, 168 countries fully or partially closed their borders with around 90 making no exceptions for those who were seeking asylum. Some countries have actually pushed asylum seekers back into the countries that they've come from or back to other countries, including children. 
And this raises real concerns about the violation of a cornerstone of international refugee law. That cornerstone is the principle of non refoulement or in other words, the principle that a country cannot push a person back to another country where they will suffer severe human rights deprivations such as persecution or torture. So this border closure or border closures all around the world cause serious problems for refugees. I'll give you some examples. Individuals who under international law have the right to seek asylum were denied the ability to even file a claim, to even seek that asylum. Um, I think the, some of the most clear examples of this happened when boats carrying asylum seekers in the Mediterranean and Adman seas were forced um, not to be able to land, not, they, they, they were denied the right to disembark which is against the international requirement under the law of the sea of rescue of those in peril. Now the closed borders have actually caused some refugees to attempt to return to their home country, just in order to, to uh, be someplace as opposed to be in the middle of transit, even when it was dangerous. But some of those who decided to go back to their own home country were denied entry due to the fear that they could bring in COVID, even though under international law, citizens have the right to return to their own country. Now, another impact of the border closures is that for the first time ever, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, together with the International Organization for Migration, had to suspend resettlements of refugees from ref refugee camps to other countries where they can permanently settle. They had to actually stop that process. And normally they would resettle approximately 110,000 refugees per year. They currently have been able to resettle less than 12,000. And they expect that 2020 will be a record low for resettlements. Healthcare that used to be provided to refugees in many countries ended up being diverted away from refugees so that it could be preserved for only citizens of those countries. This ended up leaving refugees vulnerable, not only to COVID-19 because they often live in crowded refugee camps, but also to other preventable diseases. Now, lockdowns have led to a spike in sexual and gender-based violence everywhere not only with respect to the refugee population, but all over the world. But closed borders have meant that victims of sexual and gender-based violence who might otherwise be able to make a refugee claim in another country cannot escape. The UNHCR has seen a large rise in the number of individuals who have come or called or contacted their offices around the world asking for protection from sexual and gender-based violence. And the, the UNHCR is just noting um, the impact of the lockdown and the closed borders has been so substantial on victims of sexual and gender-based violence. Another impact of the closed borders and denial of refugees to be able to even file claims of asylum is that refugees um, have also been kind of stopped from being able to find a way to support themselves. So for example, refugees have often uh, joined informal economies, so underground economies in order to survive, but the lockdown and the border closures have kept them in place and they, their um, economic livelihood or economic way of survival has just been eviscerated because of course the informal economy is one of the first places to go uh, during lockdown. Save the Children has estimated that refugees, many of them girls, account for around 40% of the 9.7 million children who were taken out of school or who, who had to stop school due to the um, lockdown mm -hmm. and border closures. And unfortunately, what that means is that for girls, where there's been the real push to, to get them into school, um, the lockdown 
and the border closures have led to a reversal of years of progress in ensuring that girls receive an education. There have unfortunately also been incidents of discrimination, stigmatization, and xenophobia directed against refugees in countries that are hosting refugee populations um, during the pandemic, exacerbating tensions within communities that host these refugees because just the, uh, the lockdown and the fear of the disease has, has uh, raised these tensions and forms of discrimination. So let me drill just a little bit deeper before I end on one particular aspect of international law and international refugee law with respect to COVID-19. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is a human rights document that has been ratified by 174 countries, so most of the countries in the world. And it indicates that while certain human rights are permitted to be limited during times of emergency such as these, the limits need to be responsive to the, um, the issue that's causing the emergency. They also have to be proportionate to the aim and they must be strictly necessary to deal with the threat. Complete border closures to refugees are disproportionate. And while they, um, countries may argue that they are needed in order to stop the transmission of disease, there are ways other than blanket measures such as complete border closure that can be used in order to both balance public health and still allow uh, refugees to, to make claims for asylum. On the positive side, the UNHCR has indicated that 113 countries have restarted their asylum processes since July with over 100 of those using creative solutions, including virtual technology to assist in the processing of asylum claims, as well as um, the UNHCR has seen those organizations that help refugees also using virtual means to help provide them with referral and counseling services. I should also mention here that there are some human rights that simply cannot be limited under international law such as the right to be free from torture and the right to life, even during a public emergency. And this is where I circle back to the norm of non refoulement which unfortunately has been violated in this um, confluence of uh, refugees being trapped due to border closures and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And this is where countries have been sending individuals back to areas where they are at severe risk um, because they could be persecuted, because they can be tortured, um, but also because they may have absolutely no access to quality health care or any health care at all. Um, so there are some real concerns in the international refugee law world with respect to the impact of COVID-19, even as there have been some solutions to um, address these impacts. Thank you. Thank you for that powerful discussion and those eye-opening statistics on the serious impact of the widespread border closures on refugees. Our next and final panelist for today is Jacob Shelley. Professor Shelley is a professor at Western Law. He holds a joint appointment with the School of Health Studies in the Faculty of Health Sciences, and his primary area of interest is the proper limits and role of law in promoting public health and preventing chronic disease. Today, he will be speaking to us on the link between global and domestic responses to the pandemic. Please join me in welcoming Professor Shelley. I think I was muted. I apologize if that was the case. So welcome. Hi, I'm going to start over in case I was muted. Uh, I don't know how many times one has to do that before they're totally embarrassed by it. But uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm going to, uh, before I start with my remarks, I think it's just uh, an interesting observation listening to Professor Ustavel talk about the, the impact that some populations have had uh, through this, this pandemic. And, and, you know, it can be at, some, at times sobering to hear 
uh, those stories when we're concerned about, you know, challenges with buying toilet paper, among other things that have arisen. Um, not to say that the problems we face in Canada or elsewhere aren't real, it's just that the degree of consequence may be very different. COVID has been an interesting opportunity to really be involved in public health law, which is the area that I've studied for over a decade, and to really watch how law has actually unfolded. And I'm not an international legal expert. Most of my international law experience comes from evaluating and looking at policies to address public health problems around food or alcohol or tobacco in other jurisdictions. And so I have been very interested in paying attention to how we've responded in Canada legally uh, compared to our, our close neighbor to the south, but also other jurisdictions around the world. And I think one of the things that will become very apparent um, post-COVID, it's apparent already, but that there have been different responses internationally, different uses of law, different approaches, and the responses have actually mattered, and we've seen that. We've seen how some jurisdictions have responded uh, uh, more swiftly, with more um, precision, with more um, uh, accuracy uh, in terms of, of, of reporting, trying to get at better testing and, and contract, contact tracing, et cetera. And these initiatives have proven to be successful. It's always going to be a question of whether or not we can simply adapt one jurisdiction's approach into another uh, domestic setting. But I think the fact that there have been very different responses to this pandemic with very different outcomes is going to actually be such a fascinating area for future study for future legal scholars, should anyone be interested in that. But one of the things in the comparison between the global and the domestic response is actually to look at the similarities. I think these similarities are, are very important in ways in which our law has not necessarily been able to respond uh, uh, with, with swiftness and where we see challenges yet coming. And so we obviously see some very similar concerns in the environment uh, uh, around the world with respect to some of the restrictions on civil liberties. And so Valerie just talked about rights and human rights and rights that are inalienable. Um, and the reality is, is that much of our discourse is nevertheless focused on another set of rights, rights to not wear a mask, rights to maintain a business, etc. And it's been an interesting uh, thing to observe how the same civil rights kind of complaints have arisen uh, throughout the world. So I think of the, the rallies that have occurred in Toronto, um, in London, elsewhere in Canada, uh, against masks and against restrictions. And you can see these happening, obviously, in the US, you see them in Germany, you see them around the world in many respects. And so there is something in these, uh, in our response as to this uh, pandemic that is, is worth reflecting on. And, and some of it is with per the perceived interference by the state. Um, and I think the public health may have some responsibility in that. Uh, much of what I do is talk about in my professional life about how to restrict and change food environments or uh, environments around alcohol consumption and, and availability or tobacco or cannabis. Or, and so often we are restricting um, uh, opportunities. And so we see that perhaps the, the pushback occurring we see also a very similar problem arising around the world, particularly um, in, in, in the US, but, but not limited to the US and the UK and Canada and Europe around misinformation. And, and we see how our current legal structures are inadequate to actually really address misinformation, particularly when we've given and ought to give such importance to the freedom of expression. But we have platforms, we have, we have unfortunately presidents that are touting misinformation um, and we've seen that our, our, our ability to respond to and to, to um, eliminate or to at least address or, or, or um, subdue that kind of inf information has, has been very challenging uh, for legal response. And then we also are now emerging in this world of excitement where we're talking about vaccines uh, that have uh, proven uh, to have some efficacy and people are very, very excited. And we are about to enter into a very, very, uh, um, tumultuous time of trying to determine what it means to equ equitably distribute vaccines. For example, today in the news, or maybe it was yesterday, Ford Motor Company was uh, reported to have bought many, many, many uh, large freezers, uh, industrial sized freezers that can hold um, uh, the Pfizer vaccine, I believe it is. Um, I may be getting that wrong and Professor Volko can correct me, but um, 
but they purchased freezers to store their own vaccines for the purpose of distributing to their workers. Now, this is a valuable thing. It's a distribution of a vaccine, but how it's being done, who's being done by is somewhat concerning. And we are going to have many, many discussions yet of what it means to equitably distribute vaccines. Now, we've seen different domestic responses. There are many we could talk about, but we're all, you know, dealing with fundamentally, in many respects, the same problem. We may have different starting points, different infrastructure. Um, and one of the things that's been mentioned a few times, and, and I think is really, really important to emphasize, is that internationally, we are going to need to see better legal coordination moving forward to, to address this. So we started with a discussion about how, why have international, international health regulations if they're going to be ignored? We are going to need to actually uh, prioritize our commitment to international laws and norms domestically and, and to, to move more towards uh, a model of cooperation and coordination. I think really importantly as well, though, we're going to need to pay in Canada attention to success that's happened elsewhere. Now, New Zealand's been a success story. Uh, we can maybe push that aside and they're a small island, they took care of themselves that way. But we've seen other countries that may be a surprise to some as successes. And, and so, for example, Vietnam has emerged as a success, particularly with how it dealt with its education system, among other things. And so I think we're going to need to actually have some humility as a relatively developed nation, um, notwithstanding some of our inequities in Canada, to actually think about what it means to learn how to address problems like, like a pandemic from, from, from countries that we might not have otherwise thought as being uh, examples. I think I'll end there just in the interest of allowing uh, questions uh, with my panelists tonight, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shelley, for that interesting discussion. I especially enjoyed learning about the importance moving forward on the equitable distribution of vaccines as we look for the next few months. Um, thank you again to all our panelists for your unique and interesting contributions. We will now move on to the moderated discussion portion of our panel, which will be moderated by Bushra and Sam. If all our participants could please put their videos back on, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Bushra, and I'm the co-president of the International Law Association. Thank you again for joining us today, and I will be moderating this panel along with Samantha Steves, who is our VP Finance for the International Law Association at Western. Um, we have received some questions in advance of this afternoon's event, and we'll be, we will be fielding live questions from the audience as well. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function in our Zoom webinar, and we will get to your question. Um, so I will start off with um, a question for all the panelists to consider, so any of you may respond. Um, COVID-19 is referred to as a global pandemic. In your opinion, how much of the response of this pandemic has been globally driven? Has state-focused action superseded any intentions of eliminating this pandemic on a global scale? So any panelists can go ahead and answer that question. I don't mind jumping in right away to say that I think this question was addressed in, in my, my good friend Ibaka's first uh, uh, presentation by saying like how we even focused our energy towards um, extracting, you know, repatriating citizens definitely demonstrated an inward focus and not an outward global focus. So I think we've already heard that a bit, but I, we also have seen in, in um, colleagues of, of ours at, uh, in law schools at, at York and in Ottawa have written about how like things like border closures have been largely symbolic acts to try to reassure the domestic population without giving consideration to things uh, on a bigger scale. So I think we have definitely seen a very state-driven response, particularly, you know, in, in, in the West more uh, than maybe elsewhere. If, so yeah, if I, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Fabian. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> uh, so if, if uh, yeah, I agree with that and I, I'll follow up by saying that, um, you know, the one thing the pandemic has shown is that uh, states, to tend to act in their own self-interest. Um, and it has really highlighted that. And, and I, in some ways, that's understandable. But what you want to see really is action that treats disease as a global problem, not one that treats it as if it's a national problem. I think that's where 
things start to fall apart is when states start to treat like it's a national problem, even though we know very well that even if you solve it, it's going to come right back because you haven't solved it globally. Um, now, having said that, I'm, I'm, I think we can also celebrate some things that speak to global cooperation. So uh, I'm very uh, heartened by uh, the announcement of the AstraZeneca vaccine, for example, which seem to have been designed from ground up to be a vaccine for global distribution, as opposed to the Pfizer or Moderna examples. Um, that was designed to be, to be cheap, to be distributed freely in places that they can afford it, uh, to be put in a fridge instead of a uh, cryogenically frozen. Uh, and so you can see that their thinking is towards global and the WHO has actually galvanized some nations to get together uh, and provide uh, financial support for making it available to countries that don't have it. So, so I'm heartened by that, but I, I think the, the response to things like this largely focuses on local interests. And we need to change that because disease is no longer uh, a national or local concern. It is now an international concern. And that's my daughter making a, all that noise behind me. I apologize. Yes, I, 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 I agree that, uh, that there's quite a bit that uh, may seem a little depressing in the response that we've had. Uh, but I, I, I would like to sound a, a slightly more positive note as uh, Rebecca has, has, uh, has done. Um, one one thing I'm, I I would like to mention is the, uh, the the cooperation international cooperation in in research. Uh, this uh, I I don't know much about uh, medical research, but from what I've read, uh, the level of cooperation and particularly the sharing of data uh, has been uh, unprecedented. Uh, on on the on the more normative side of things, which is a little bit uh, closer to my territory. Um, I, I would highlight that uh, even though there's not very much uh, by way of a global response, I think uh, I think we've seen uh, quite quite a bit of, uh, of of sharing of best practices. Uh, there's there's quite a lot of exchange that is informal, and even even though states behave as self-interested sovereign states, uh, they do look across uh, their borders uh, to see what other people are doing. Uh, and the possibilities that uh, that they that they have uh, in their response, and we've seen, I, I think, a, a very high level uh, of that information sharing uh, during the crisis. So that's that's a slightly positive note in the uh, in the otherwise rather depressing uh, scenario that we have. Awesome! Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is also available to any of the panelists, and it is, what do you see as the greatest challenge in the field of international law resulting from COVID-19? That's a huge question, Samantha. <laughs> um, I don't know, well, I think that we've already identified one of the greatest challenges, and that is cooperation among states for the greater good of the international um, of international health and um, the greater good in tackling a problem that is truly global. So I think that is one significant issue. But I think that in every area of international law, there are also sort of sub issues that come from that. So I already talked about the border closures that states used. Uh, now they, they wanted to use border closures to keep out people who may, might bring in COVID-19. That was their reasoning behind it. And also so that they wouldn't expose their border officials to COVID-19. But many countries already had pre-existing political reasons to keep borders or to make borders closed. And they used the lockdown to benefit their other political reasons, for example, in the United States. So that's also uh, a problem that is difficult to address because even if one proposes solutions, for example, the UNHCR is proposing solutions so that more um, uh, people can be, uh, they can make asylum claims, uh, 
when the political situation exists that that underlies the reasons for the border closure apart from COVID-19, that's not going to resolve those issues. Well, I'll jump in quickly. Um, I think, you know, I completely agree with those comments, but I, another challenge is the politicization of international uh, law and international response to, to crisis. Uh, and I, I think you see that in sort of the, the refugee context, you see that in the context of uh, health and pandemics, uh, in the context of persons who um, are, are trying to uh, uh, immigrate for better opportunities uh, elsewhere. There just seems to be, it, it's, it's increasingly the case that instead of thinking of sort of an overarching norm that should guide international relations and that should guide how we make law about uh, our international relations, we seem to be pulling apart, right? We saw that in the actions of the US uh, president in pulling out of the WHO in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and I think the politicization of international responses which I think has always been there, but has seems to have become heightened, doesn't bode well for how we actually create norms um, and laws to deal with things like COVID-19. Um, hopefully the US rejoins the WHO, uh, but I think they've set a really bad example, which is if you're not doing what I want, what I want, I'm out. And I think that's, that's the really dangerous lesson they've said is because international uh, relations and international law does not really operate around the idea of insularity and <laughs> selfishness. Uh, you have to be willing to give up something. And, and I hope people don't pick up on the Trump example uh, and run with it. I'll, I'll be very, very quick. And I'm, so this is a bit of a tangent, um, but it's important that one of the things that this will help us realize is that what is happening currently internationally has been happening. So for example, in the context of sugar, WHO came out with guidelines, US said, do do this and we pull out. So we have had a structure in place for a long time where states have been bullying the WHO. And I think we now have maybe realized the importance of having an independent uh, and, and not in that kind of political influence. It's not new. It's just that this time it's such a, a grand scale that it's, it's, we can observe it. I, I, I would I, I would agree that uh, this is this is a problem that we've had. It's just highlighted the weaknesses of international law. Uh, there's always been a struggle in international law uh, to, uh, I think, moving from, I, I would use Lon Fuller's uh, image, uh, moving from a, a logic of reciprocity, self-interested give and take uh, between sovereign states to a logic of shared understandings and common purpose. Uh, this is uh, what the crisis has highlighted for international law, and the tension, I think, has not changed. Uh, sorry, if I may just jump back. These are very fascinated by this question, and I, I'm, I'm going to put Valerie on the spot here, uh, because I, I think it's one thing to say it's always existed, right? Uh, but it's all, also existed within national borders, the politicization of everything, and I mean, it, it, it doesn't necessarily, I think, reduce the legitimacy of international law. It never has to the scale that we're seeing now, where it's about undermining the system in such a way that it doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's one thing to say I'm not going to be a signatory to this because I disagree with what you've proposed. It's another thing, I think, to say I will pull funds from you <laughs> so as to make you not exist anymore. Um, the U.S. T has a tendency to disagree on this, uh, some international commitments where it feels like its national interests are being compromised in any way. But I think there's something different about this action where they are saying we, we're actually out to kill this organization. And I can tell you, you know, because I, I was at WHO shortly before this pandemic started, and they struggle with funding. <laughs> the U.S. pulling out of the WHO is basically a dead nail. And that to me was something different, something on a different scale. I think it was about an existential thing for the WHO. And, and Valerie, I don't know, you know, if what's your take on this? Have you seen examples of that before where there's an attempt to actually not just uh, disagree, but delegitimize and uh, destroy, essentially? Well, I mean, the only thing I meant to say is that, is that the, these attacks have been on 
institutions that have made inroads uh, into the principle of state sovereignty. And we're just taking that back uh, in a way that is a uh, be qualified as savage uh, and I, I fully agree with that it's it's shocking uh, because many of us believe that we had made so much progress in international law and uh, we saw how quickly that that can go okay uh, thank you all for all those insights. That was an incredible discussion on that one question. Um, we have another question here. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, many countries blamed others for not stopping the spread of the virus or for being negligent in their proactive um, policies. How do you see this impacting relations between countries during negotiations of treaties and other interactions going forward? That's a really interesting question, and I'm not, I'm not 100% sure that these claims of negligence um, will impact treaty negotiations, generally speaking, but certainly they won't help for treaty negotiations that directly relate to, for example, the need to cooperate on health-related issues or even on, on human rights related issues. And they will, depending on the country, now of course um, we saw this mostly raised between China and the United States, the United States blaming China, um, that China reacts to any criticism. So it's just not gonna help with relations between China and the United States or any other country that is making a similar response. This is not my area, but I'm an academic, so I can speak to it. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, this is not my area, but I think one of the things that we will see that comes that comes out of this in the, in the difficulties with negotiation is uh, that, that may alleviate, I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, the, the comment earlier about the cooperation internationally around data and around science. There might be an opportunity to this that we can actually have a leveling of our discussion because there has been a common experience and as, if we can get to the common language for discussions where it was some things when we're talking about like again i mostly work in food and tobacco but the, the use of tobacco the types of food these are not necessarily universal there's um we have different approaches we have different uh, uh agricultural systems we have different cultural religious reasons for what we do but COVID has been kind of a, a leveling in some respects, so it might provide an opportunity for for in, engaging in a new type of discourse because we have a common uh, starting point. So there's there are potential benefits, but I'm no expert in this area, so that's just a it's just an unfounded thought. Excellent. Well, we have a live question here, and the question is for Professor Oosterveld, But anybody, feel free to jump in. Um, so the question is, regarding the issues of denying refugees and abuse within refugee camps, do you believe that the structures set in place by the UN and other international bodies will hold countries accountable for breaching international conventions, or will these issues be likely swept away and as failures during the pandemic? Thank you for that question. Um, so that one of the main challenges in international law, particularly international human rights law, international refugee law, that the public international law side, is that there are not easy routes in order to hold countries accountable in ways that we would traditionally think were, were uh, would be accountability. So for example, I am very sure that there will not be any lawsuits by one country against another brought to the International Court of Justice with respect to the way refugees have been treated. Um, I suspect that where any accountability might come would be, so for example, in discussions in, um, within the UNHCR amongst countries or could be potentially in the UN Human Rights Council 
but more often it would be kind of at the diplomatic level, at the level of discussion. The UNHCR is in a tricky position. It needs states to provide funding and cooperation and assistance all over the world in order for it to be able to do its job. So while it, it can go a certain distance in criticizing states, critiquing states for the way that it has dealt with asylum claims or lack of asylum claims or lack of dealing with discrimination against refugees or lack of dealing with schooling for refugee uh, girls, for example, they can only go so far before states may push back or turn away or stop cooperating altogether. So there's this real diplomacy dance that has to happen. And it's only really in there, unfortunately, that I think there'll be these sorts of uh, discussions on failures. Okay, so I see we're a bit over time, so we'll do one last question. Um, thank you for being patient and staying on. Um, our last question is um, generally for the whole panelists. Um, countries with autocratic leaders like the Philippines and Hungary have used lockdown measures for safety to also consolidate their power. And so what measures do you think the international community can take to ensure that emergency powers granted during a crisis aren't abused? We like to point fingers, so let's not pretend that our politicians in Canada haven't used their responses to this to, to consolidate power. Uh, Iraq is in Alberta, and I think part of what they're doing there is, is speaking to their base. Uh, Doug Ford's failure to respond appropriately in the last few months has largely been uh, a return to his base and his ideological perspectives. It may not be as, uh, as of a frightening, you know, authoritarian approach, but but that's part of politics right now. And I think that's, it's a hard question. I don't have the answer for how to better regulate or, or ensure this isn't happening. But let's just not, let's not be too quick to point too many fingers because this is a, this is a homegrown problem right now as well. So um, I don't know if I'm, you can hear me. Yeah, I'll, I'll sort of add to that comment as well by saying that I think, you know, the, the pandemic is ongoing we have a, a lot of time to sort of reflect on what approaches have been taken, sit with it, ask ourselves what worked and what didn't work. Uh, I think we shouldn't confuse, uh, you know, autocratic uh, actions in, in normal times <laughs> with autocratic actions in terms of a pandemic. These are countries with autocratic leaders who are autocratic anyway. Um, the extent to which they, you know, the, the way they govern affected the pandemic response, I think we need some time to sort of tease that out. I'm not an expert on these two countries and in the countries that I, uh, the country that I live in and the country that I am fam familiar with, uh, if you think about your responses, uh, you know, one might say some governments became more autocratic <laughs> as, as the pandemic started. Uh, and uh, some, even though they, they don't meet the definition of, uh, you know, being fascist or autocratic, have certainly not handled the pandemic well. Um, but I think what you'll find in countries like that is um, it, that these are autocratic leaders who do have some understanding of the local context. And so it, one might be tempted to say they are being autocratic, but we don't understand the context in which they are, they are acting. Um, and if, if the decisions actually make sense in the context of those countries. So I, I, I wouldn't be too quick to judge as well. I do hate autocratic leaders. Um, anyone who follows me on Twitter knows. So um, I'm inclined to just jump on that question and go, yeah, down with the autocrats. <laughs> so this, this issue has actually been raised at a number of levels within the United Nations system. And uh, I'm sorry if you hear my dog who happens to want to be sitting in my lap right now. She is right here. <laughs> I'm sorry that she's yawning. Um, the United Nations, within the United Nations Security Council, there's been real concern about the way in which um, in certain places, the COVID-19 response has then um, been used in a way to respond to a country's security, but, but, but in, or, in order to actually accomplish other goals, other goals of uh, controlling the population, not necessarily only for health purposes, but for other purposes. So it's, there's awareness within the international system of this problem, 
the the challenge is like what is the solution how how to deal with it the un human rights council is concerned about it there are ways that complaints can be made through the human rights committee um, but that is not going to necessarily undo what has happened with the autocratic regimes that you mentioned Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And absolutely, I think that this, that clarification was definitely necessary, that there was a lot of fear that pe people were kind of facing in terms of when the pandemic started, in terms of the emergency powers that the Finn leaders were taking on. And of course, different countries respond in different ways. And as a general citizen, even I was scared in terms of how our governments were responding to these issues. So I think that there's definitely a lot of um, uncertainty in terms of you know, wh where the line lies between politicizing something or actually responding to something in an effective uh, manner. So um, I think that that that's where we'll have to end it off for today. Thank you so much, um, everyone, uh, for joining in. And on behalf of the Western International Law Association, I'd like to extend my greatest thanks to all the panelists. Um, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules. I know this is an incredibly busy time of the year and um, for sharing your thoughts and having an excellent discussion today. Um, I'd like to uh, specifically thank um, Professor Osterveld and the Western uh, Public and Private International Law Research Group for helping us organize this event and Jessica and Samantha for your efforts today as well. And Corey, who's logged off, our systems administrators, who's helped us set up our technical way um, for the Zoom webinar to happen. And thank you for everyone who attended. We hope this discussion was insightful and that you take something away from today's um, talk. So best of luck with exams and we hope everyone stays safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.